Welcome in, everybody, to the flagship podcast. I'm Chip Brown of Horns247.com, joined as always by the managing editor of Horns247, Taylor Estes. And Taylor, um, it is Tuesday. Rodney Terry was introduced as the new men's basketball coach of the Texas Longhorns after an unbelievable uh, season in what I call Texas becoming the most resilient team in college basketball this year. I mean, how many other teams had their head coach jailed eight games yeah. into the season and had to pull it together and uh, end up winning the the conference tournament in the most difficult conference in college basketball and reach the elite eight and win the third most games in program history. Yeah. Not many. I mean, I would hope not, right? Like this was such a a crazy wild situation that Texas basketball went through and Rodney Terry was tasked with being the leader of the circus that followed honestly Chris Beard getting arrested on a suspicion of domestic violence charges that were eventually dropped but still I mean, you know, Chip, I think um the fa- just hearing Rodney Terry today in his introductory press conference and his communication with the team, the entire basketball team was there. First of all, he's in his press conference and he's still almost like he's in a team meeting being like, Hey, what do I say about this? What do I say about this? And they all answered. And I just feel like seeing that type of chemistry between him and this team that he took over for and never expected to be the head coach of um, was really special. And it just further cemented, I feel like, the, you know, kind of the cherry on top of the Cinderella story of what Rodney Terry and Texas basketball was this season. And he's being rewarded in a substantial way. And I think a well-deserved way. I'm glad you brought that up because I, I kind of led with that in my story today from Rodney Terry's press conference. I thought it was, I mean, I felt like we were sitting in on, like you said, a team meeting. It it was like, Mm -hmm. he was still talking to the guys in the locker room. You know, he asked some um, about the foundation of the program. What's our foundation, guys? Defense. <laughs> Defense every day. <laughs> yeah. We're, you know, what what beats pressure? Preparation. Mm-hmm. And um, and then when he tells that story about when he asks the guys, "Do you want to be a grasshopper or an eagle?" and then starts talking about how he grew up in the country in Angleton and Brazoria County, and said, "You know, we had some grasshoppers." who couldn't fly, <laughs> they could jump real high. Yeah. And, and everybody just starts, he's laughing at himself. Everybody else is laughing. Um, but the players were, uh, you could see the bond. You could see that mm-hmm. bond that helped this team come together in crisis and um, continue to to push for their goals, um, getting all the way to the Elite Eight. And, uh, and Ronnie Terry said, we're going to, we're going to be a Monday night program kind of echoing the, the Chris Beard mantra. Um, and he said, we're going to get there sooner than you think. So Rodney Terry is, he's a confident man. He was very comfortable in his own skin in that press conference uh, with the interaction with his, with his team, his current team. And then how about LaMarcus Aldridge coming down from Dallas to be in this, uh, to be at this press conference. He said, Hey, RT was there for me when I was here at Texas because RT was an assistant then. And he said, now it's my time and my turn to be there for him. And, you know, I want to support this program and help bring some new talent in here. You get guys like a seven-time all-star like LaMarcus Aldridge, who's not been around the program a ton, Taylor. Right, yeah. You know, he obviously he's been very busy with an NBA playing career, but, um, you know, he he hasn't been as present in the summers as even Kevin Durant. And and now you're seeing this, you know, these former players who were there for the golden time of of Texas basketball when Rodney was there. You know, I've had some people joke with me that, hey, man, Texas was pretty darn good when Rodney was an assistant there from. 2002 to 2011, a final four, three elite eights, five sweet 16s. And then it went to hell after he left. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, 
the, the timeline kind of, kind of measures up, but that having that kind of support TJ Ford and TJ Ford saying what everyone else was thinking this year, that this team was fun to watch. They were mm-hmm. offensively fun to watch. I mean, they, you love to watch them play offense. Whereas under Chris Beard, under Rick Barnes at times, it was so much about the defense that guys weren't ever in the flow offensively. And it wasn't a lot of fun to watch. So, um, I, I don't know that, and, and and Rodney Terry turned 55 yesterday and, yeah. and everyone's like, Oh, what a great birthday. You get a five-year contract to become the head coach at Texas. And he said, I was kind of hoping for a trip to the final four for my birthday. <laughs> yeah. That would have been the best birthday present. Hey, and in addition to that five-year contract, he uh, also got a $15.3 million uh, birthday present that you had uh, reported chip through sources that that's the value of the deal. Um, so in comparison, I don't have the figures. I know, you know, it off the top of your head in comparison to Chris Beard, how much money is Texas kind of saving by hiring Rodney Terry? Yeah. So 2 million less per year. And, and for Rodney Terry, um, you know, that's about right. I mean, he's in the $3 million club. Scott drew at Baylor's won a national championship makes 3.7 million. So I think Rodney's coming in and look, Rodney made about $750,000 as the head coach at UTEP. Mm -hmm. And, and then he made about 850,000 this year um, with that uh, salary increase after, after Beard left. So this is a a nice pay raise for Rodney Terry. And, um, you know, I just liked how comfortable he was. He wasn't up there fishing around for answers and like trying to figure it out. And Taylor, you and I both know to survive at Texas, not survive, but thrive at Texas. You've got to know exactly who you are, how you're going to go about things, what you're recruiting is going to look like so that you're always on point. And they did a great job. I mean, Rodney had a lot to do with the roster that Chris Beard put together um, that came through big time this season, but it was Rodney Terry who did a lot of the recruiting of those players. And in fact, I asked Rodney for an example of, of his recruiting that maybe he's most proud of. He said, listen, Marcus Carr was a tough get, you know, Mm -hmm. everybody wanted Marcus Carr, Kansas, Kentucky, everybody wanted him and we got him." And, and Rodney's recruited the best of the best. Um, He, you know, he helped recruit, heck, uh, LaMarcus and Daniel Gibson and uh, that 2016 that went to the Elite Eight, P.J. Tucker. So, you know, Rodney knows what he's doing and it, it sure feels like he's he's ready for this job. And and he said, I asked him about the staff. He said, I hope this whole staff will come back and we go on another great run. And I think that's that's really important. I mean, he is, he's probably going to bring in at least one new assistant. Cause I think Chris Ogden will move off of the coaching staff and go back to his, his managing director role, overseeing NIL and roster management. And, and so Rodney will be able to bring in, um, you know, at least one of his own assistants from, from what I'm hearing. And, you know, I think it's great. He's got, he's got Bob Donawald, who's a former head coach, Steve McLean as a special assistant, who's a former head coach, Chris Ogden, former head coach. This staff did a great job of preparing game plans, getting players to execute. And, and now Taylor, he's got to re-recruit his underclassmen who until they knew who the coach was going to be, were non-committal. I mean, after that loss to Miami in the elite eight, everyone, Tyrese Hunter, uh, Dylan Mitchell, Dylan Dazu, all of them were like, I don't know, man. I don't know yet. You know, and and now with Rodney Terry getting the job, you you would hope that uh maybe that brings you know the guys back uh for another year. We'll see. Um, you know, the NBA, uh, as Rodney Terry said, family um decisions will 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 be in play here and and we'll see how uh, all the players handle it but uh sure felt like there was a lot of excitement from the players toward Rodney Terry 
Yeah. And when you're talking about his his coaching staff at Texas and him saying that, we're not sure if that was a coach speak answer or not, right? right? But at the end of the day, I think that this is a situation where if he does keep the staff all intact and maybe just brings on one assistant, I don't think this is a situation like how – say when like Tom Herman was hired and there were a lot of fans being like, why is he bringing non power five coaches, assistant coaches along with him?" And like, kind of like he had to, they had to prove themselves from the jump basically because of that. This is, I just don't see this whole season happening the way it did. If the coaching staff was not all in alignment fully every single day and had really solid working relationships with one, with one another. And honestly, that's, probably a credit to Chris Beard too, because he did put the staff together. But I don't, I feel like, you know, if, if he does choose to keep everybody intact and not have to go and try to hire some big name assistant coaches, I think, I don't think that is necessarily a bad thing because it's like, they've shown that they can work together. They've shown they can work together in a way that to, you know, actually get, um, get product or, you know, the success on the court and make it past the first round of the NCAA tournament, win three NCAA tournament games for the first time since what, 2008? I mean, it's a, it's been a long type of like drought that Texas has had in the NCAA tournament. And I just don't think, regardless of the team, obviously deserves a ton of credit. Rodney Terry deserves a ton of credit. I just don't think this team would have made it that far into the tournament had there been a not really positive, solid working relationship among the assistant coaches and Rodney Terry, and that can carry over. And it can also help in recruiting, I think, too. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I felt like this staff, with the way they were putting together game plans and executing those game plans and getting those players to buy in, you don't get players to buy in night in and night out unless those game plans are working and the players are seeing, man, whatever they tell us, we got to do it because it works and we're winning. We're beating Kansas by 20. And, and that I agree with you. I think there was a, a great chemistry. And I asked Rodney about it after the press conference. I said, okay, you know, you hope the whole staff can come back, but why? And he said, there was just a lack of ego. We were all in that together and everybody was doing their part. And there was no, you know, there was no infighting about who's getting credit for what we just, wanted to do everything we could to help this team win. And, and I believe it. I mean, that's, I've talked to enough people around the program who feel like, you know, here you have Bob Donawald, former head coach, um, you know, Steve McLean, former head coach and Chris Ogden, former head coach and, and Rodney Terry's a former head coach as well, but they had fun working together. You know, Rodney, yeah. you saw it today. He's a funny guy. I mean, he's a comic relief guy. And so, yeah, it's it. There are tough moments, and he, you know, I said, okay, Rodney, you've always been the good cop on staffs. You're the guy that the players go to after Rick Barnes or Chris Beard just completely erases their self confidence <laughs> after a crappy practice. What does bad cop Rodney Terry look like? And he's like, listen, man. He's like, I'll get hard on guys. I'll tell them why it's important for them to you know, focus more on, on something, but you know, he's like, I'm never going to go home wondering if I was too hard on a guy because I'm going to get with him after that practice mm -hmm. and make sure he's good. And I just think that Rodney gets that personal connection so much that guys are not afraid to, to bring up things in the huddle. I mean, Marcus Carr in the Penn state game, they're designing a play for him. And he says, no, Dylan DeZoo, what does Dylan DeZoo want? And you think Marcus Carr would have ever said that in a huddle with Chris Beard or Rick Barnes? I mean, and you know what? Marcus Carr was right. Mm -hmm. And Dylan DeZoo scored on three straight possessions. Um, LaMarcus Aldridge talked about it again today, said, man, he carried us through the end of that Penn State game. And honestly, they needed Dylan DeZoo. In the Miami game, when I know. Miami made that same run at about the same time, and and Texas needed an answer basket, and here you had Dylan DeZue, who was averaging twenty two and a half and ten rebounds in the first two NCAA tournament games, and the you know the kid 
uh, couldn't catch a break uh, with the, with the foot injury. So, um, but the chemistry, the, you know, the empowerment, he empowered those kids and gave them confidence. And Dylan Dazoo talked about that. And, and I think that's why Rodney Terry, who is also an excellent recruiter, uh, is going to have a, a high, high level uh, chance for success. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think, too, when you talk about, you know, him be like how he's going to be as a head coach, who if who, it, can he be the bad cop type of thing? He talked about taking that year, I guess it was a little bit over a year away from being a head coach when he left UTEP to join Chris Beard's staff. And a big reason that he talked about was how, you know, he felt like he needed to get away because he felt like he wasn't really enjoying every day like he always wanted to, to be a head basketball coach. It had been his goal his whole life to be a head coach of the college level, but it's very easy to also get kind of distracted and making like focusing on all of the different moving parts to where you're not enjoying the process. And I think that hearing him talk about that and how he is ready to enjoy the process too, is only going to make it better. Cause you're right. He has a great personality. He's funny. He's um, endearing, you know, I think, and he's a guy that especially after this college basketball season, even nationwide, I feel like people, even people who I think hate, you know, always rooted against Texas and hate Texas were like, this is a great story. I want to see this continue. And that is a hard, hard thing to do when you're at a school like Texas that has, you know, a huge brand recognition. And then what follows that is a ton of haters that hate the brand that they see and recognize all the time. I just feel like, you know, this is, he, I just feel understands what he's doing. And I think that's a big part of being a coach at the University of Texas, regardless of the sport, but especially if you are one of the three major sports at Texas, you have to know, as you said, who you are, what you're doing, what your approach is. He has the experience being at Texas. He understands the what's expected from the booster level, all of that. Now he has a chance to be the head coach of it. And it's just, it's hard not to think that this is going to work, assuming that, you know, the recruiting continues the way it is, that they can hold on to some of these um, underclassmen that, you know, didn't maybe were mum to talk about their future at Texas after the loss to Miami, not knowing what, who the head coach was going to be. But I mean, if, if they can keep this all in, in line, I, 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 I totally believe him saying that this could be a Monday night team and it's going to happen sooner rather then later, especially with his connection with the former players and bringing those guys back on there, the Kevin Durant, the LaMarcus Aldridge, the TJ Ford. I mean, I know TJ is already kind of involved. Um, you know, Tristan, he mentioned Tristan Thompson even too. I mean, there's a lot of guys that he coached, big name guys. And if he can bring, be the tie in the mold that brings those guys back in to the, the basketball program, that only helps him recruiting too. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you bring up a really good point because, um, you know, when you're at Fresno state, you take over a program that had had four straight losing seasons and you have to change everything about that culture. And then you get, you bring in players, you develop them. And then the bigger programs come and, and take those players by transfer. Now, you know, he talked about that and said, you know, it, it, it's exhausting. And, and at that mid-major level, he said that it's a big concern at the mid-major level programs like Fresno state and UTEP where the bigger programs like Texas um, come in and take their best players. I mean, Texas is trying to re recruit a kid in the portal right now um, from rice a kid named Oliveri, who's unbelievable player had 28 against Texas in that uh, game on the day that Chris Beard went to jail um, and, and so, you know, Rodney's now at that program with it, it's built, you know, yeah. and he helped build it. I mean, now current recruits can say, oh man, y'all were in the elite eight. You had that, that great run and they saw it. They don't have to be told about it from 2008. Right. And, and so Rodney comes into this situation. It's, it's built and, um, you know, he's got to maintain it, sustain it. That's the hardest part of it, you know, winning when you're supposed to win. But um, it, it, you know, it's, uh, 
it, it was interesting to hear him talk about the, the that he wasn't enjoying it as much as he should have because he was just constantly trying to maintain the program, um, fend off, you know, programs from coming in and taking his best players. Yeah. And and just constantly trying to convince players that they could be more than what the program had been. Yeah, it's almost like they're like the farm team, you know, for bigger programs. It's kind of like what Terry Bowden said when we had him on the flagship podcast prior to the football season of what happens at um uh oh my gosh, why Yeah, ULM. Him? ULM. Yeah, I was going to say Lafayette. I'm like, no, he's not at Lafayette. Yeah, ULM. I mean, he thought yeah. what that Go TCU ahead. came in and took his best cornerback, Josh Newton, yeah. and Newton was a all-conference player this year. Yeah, and you know, you heard guys like um like, uh, gosh, I, I am like not good with names right now. We had them on our podcast too, UTSA. I, oh, uh, Jeff Trailer. Jeff Trailer. He talked about, I mean, he publicly tweeted about it, like in tampering and stuff. That That's the new level. And it's like those mid-major programs. It's not just happening in football. It's happening in basketball too. They're kind of the farm system almost-esque that for some of the bigger programs now if they have a good season. So, I mean, yeah, I think – it's going to be really fascinating to see how he does as a head coach and being on the opposite side of that table. Um, but I think, you know, him talking about how um, people that talk about this being Chris Beard's team and all of that type of thing, he said, you know, even when Chris Beard was there, he had like a thing. It was no egos. We all are working together. We all recruit together. We're all doing this together. It's not an ego type of thing. Sounds like that's kind of, um, continued on. And if that can continue, that's huge. And, and it's not something that you have to sell these guys like, oh, you can be the guys to help bring Texas back to the glory years of Kevin Durant and TJ Ford and going, you know, multiple, more than one weekend or one game into the NCAA tournament. They have that on paper now. It's like, you can continue where we left off. And that's a totally, I think, different recruiting uh, pitch that can work in Texas benefit and something that probably had been working a little bit against them um, with how long of a drop they had from, you know, even reaching the lead eight. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah. Now you can say to Ron Holland and AJ Johnson um, and the kid Oliveri at Rice, Hey, you come and take us to Monday night. You know, mm-hmm. we, yeah. we were, we were 12 minutes from going to the final four. You come and, you know, help us uh, get over the edge and take us to the final four. And um, yeah, really interesting conversation. Rodney Terry um, praised uh, Brian Dutcher at San Diego state for being able to maintain his roster enough uh, to get to the final four and, and Florida Atlantic, same thing. So it, um, it can be done, but, Rodney Terry doesn't have to worry about that now because he's at Texas. So um, Taylor, <laughs> and real he bought quick. a house in Austin in 2020. He mentioned that just out of the blue, bought a house in Austin 2020, and he now has that here. <laughs> yep, he said, "I'm. I know I want to be back in Austin when my coaching days are done, so I might as well get into the market now before it goes even higher." And <laughs> and now look, now look at it. So, um. It uh, it was a cool scene at that yeah. press conference, Taylor. The the actual Elite Eight game against Miami was a heartbreaker. Um, that locker room was as devastated as I've ever been in after after a game, and um, it, uh, it man, I, it, it just they ran out of magic. Um, and without Dylan Dazu, we talked about that a little bit. Uh, just here's a kid who's just soaring. You talk about, you want to be a grasshopper or an Eagle. Dylan DeZue is a Eagle, full blown Eagle. And, and then he suffers the bone bruise and can only play two minutes against Xavier. Honestly, beating Xavier without Dylan DeZue was impressive. Unbelievable Mm -hmm. defense played in that game. But then Marcus Carr, you know, rolls his ankle on a weird you know, he's going up to try and save a, a, a ball that Timmy Allen, you know, was trying to save from going out of bounds, rolls his ankle, leaves the game, goes to the locker room, comes back. He wasn't the same. The offense wasn't moving the ball the same and, and credit Miami. They, they were as confident as a thunderstorm. 
down the stretch of that game, attacking the basket, making tough contested shots. Um, just an unbelievable game. You know, the, the officials got a little whistle happy in the second half, 28 fouls. Um, you know, 28 times Miami goes to the free throw line in the second half, uh, 32 for the game. It, there was no flow to the game. Miami was getting to score with the clock stopped, which certainly helped them come back from that 13 point deficit with 12 minutes to go. Um, just frustrating, but uh, unbelievable season. And these guys were still almost, well, this close. The game was tied with a minute left. So, um, you know, just a uh, great, great season and a great uh, final, you know, 10 minutes for, for Miami which had been in the elite eight the year before they were pissed off and nothing was going to stop them. So um, just a great, uh, a great season and uh, uh, tough ending, but man, they lived up to their seating. I mean, they were a number two seed. They were supposed to get to the elite eight. They got there. Yeah. And I mean, think about what they were, what everybody's expectations were for Texas basketball after Chris Beard was suspended and then ultimately fired. I mean, nobody expected they expected it's human, you know, like nature to let that type, that level of adversity, that high profile public attention, constant negative storyline uh, adversity that these young men had to go through. It would be very easy to have that push the train like off the track, off the rails. And, and they kept it together. And it, that's even more of it. You know, I said last, Last week on the flagship podcast, I know it sounds like silly. I know what a Cinderella story is or, you know, all of that. But Texas was kind of a Cinderella story, as crazy as it sounds, being a two seed in the NCAA tournament. If you consider where this program was at the beginning or the middle of December following that Chris Beard thing. I mean, the, talk about a season of roller coasters, right? Start off being like potential Final Four team. Nobody then, you know, losing all expectations. Everyone think you're going to tank. And then you were, you know, 12 minutes away from actually being that final four team. It's wild, Chip, when you look at the the stat line here. I mean, in the first half, both teams had five free throw attempts. Um, in the second half, Miami had 27 free throw attempts. Texas had 10. <laughs> so yeah. that is a, a little lopsided. But, um, yeah, I mean, you still a, can't. Yeah. Go ahead. The, the, the Brock Cunningham, you know, the, he's boxing out the guy, but the guy was high in the air over his back. And because Brock, you know, thinks there's a guy behind him, he's boxing out. He kind of falls backwards and un gets called for undercutting the guy. And you're like, what? Well, even so, the other player thought he got the foul on right. him. He thought and he fouled out. <laughs> that was a critical point in the game. Yeah, it was. I mean, critical. It was, mm -hmm. you know, minute left. It was anybody's game. You're right. Nor Chad O'Meara would have fouled out of the game. Instead, he ends up scoring down the stretch, uh, hit a couple free throws. It, you know, it was just a tough, tough way to go. You you wanted to see both teams at their at their best, like we saw uh, early in the in the second half. I mean, obviously, it would have been you know both teams at their best would have meant Dylan Dazu playing, but that's that's how it goes. Injuries are part of it, and um, you know, it was, it was an unbelievable season. And, and, you know, if you, you know, think back on the moments, you know, pick your favorite moment, right. it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's hard. I mean, yeah, I, I can think back to the second half of the K-State win in Manhattan when Texas came back from a 14 point deficit. Um, so, and my gosh, the big 12 tournament where, uh, Dylan DeZoo emerges and they beat Kansas by 20 in Kansas city in a building full of rock chalk. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, this team was tough and, and fun to watch and fun to cheer for. You're right. It's unbelievable to say that about a Texas team that they were sort of the, the country's sentimental favorite, but it's kind of true. Yeah, only one home loss too all season. Yeah. So yeah. Rodney Terry starts off his career at Texas twenty two and eight as a head coach. Um, the one home loss did it. It came under him, right? It was K State, yeah, Kansas State. Yeah, um, that was the game Terry where game. yeah he had to tell the team, "Hey, we can be free flowing on offense, yeah. but we got to play defense." Yeah, was, exactly. They lost one sixteen to one hundred three. Yeah. <laughs>
that was an NBA, like a circa eighties NBA game where no defense was being played, but um, you know, and then K state gets to the elite eight too. So yeah, uh, really, really some cool storylines, but. Well, real uh, quick. I, I also think this is important to touch on that. Chris Del Conte had mentioned as he was introducing Rodney Terry as head coach. He told a story about how um, he and uh the board of regents chairman Kevin Altife had were talking soon after the Chris Beard, you know, suspension and Rodney Terry coming in, and that Kevin Altife's like, We have our guy, we have our guy. And mind you, Kevin Altife is one of the guys that's been involved in hiring a lot of the coaches that have been hired, including, uh, you know, Chris Beard, too. But and, uh, you know, Del Conte had to say, like, Yeah, but we don't make you know, head coaching just hires in season. And then he goes, that was on December 13th. So that would have been one day after that first game that uh, Rodney Terry coached Texas, same day that Chris Beard was arrested and let, you know, suspended that on the December 12th against Rice where they won in overtime. I thought that was really interesting. And then Chris Del Conte talking about how he, you know, handing the whistle over to Rodney Terry and he was like, you go earn this job, you go get this job. And Rodney Terry said that he was confident the whole time. You know, he was confident in his preparation. He was confident in what they, their message was, what this team was built on, that he would, you know, he was never worried about not getting the job. And I think that that says a lot, but it's really interesting that literally day, what he wasn't even interim head coach at that point. He was acting Acting. head coach, right? Yeah. So uh, one day as an acting head coach and the guy that's been in charge or leading the charge for a lot of the hires for Texas athletics lately is like, we have our guy already. <laughs> so I thought that was a really good behind the scenes type of story. Yeah. And I don't know if that, if, if Del Conte was getting a little carried away there, but, um, cause you know, I'd heard that they really came around, you know, they did their homework on some other candidates oh, yeah. and after the big 12 tournament, after Texas won the big 12 tournament that slowed down. And, you know, I was told if they just, if they just avoid falling flat uh, in the NCAA tournament, it's probably Rodney Terry's job. And sure enough, uh, once they were in the sweet 16, that job was, was Rodney Terry's. And, and so, yeah. They they had already done their due diligence recently too, on some of the coaches because Chris Beard was, you know, it's less than two years removed from him being named head coach at Texas. Right. And it was a weird year for some of those coaches that they were strongly considering. Then Eric Musselman at Arkansas rips off his shirt and makes it about him. <laughs> um, Nate Oates at Alabama probably lost the PR battle, um, you know, involving his, his best player, Brandon Miller's connection to a fatal shooting. And, and so it all worked you know, everything aligned for, for Rodney Terry to, to be in the moment, be present. You know, we talked about him losing his father in August and how he just realized there's more to life and that he does need to soak it in. He does need to enjoy the moment he needs. And he told that to his players all the time, which I think really endeared them to him Mm -hmm. because we see all the time coaches, you know, berating a player because they didn't, you know, set the screen or grab the rebound. And Rodney Terry was reassuring his team all year long. We're built for this. We're, we're good. We're ready. We can handle this. Um, to, that's what he was saying to them at the end of the Penn state game. And, and was saying it to him even in the Miami game, but um, they just, they ran out of magic, but it, um, or manpower uh, with yeah. the on the bench. But uh, this is going to be fun to watch because I get the feeling that Rodney Terry has a a plan already in terms of what he wants in terms of staff, players, and portal. And, and then we know Rodney can, can go get it done because we've seen him recruit. And, and so we'll see, we'll see what happens, but there's a lot of excitement and they got a new building that, is a great home court advantage as well. They got a two five stars coming in Ron Holland and AJ Johnson. Uh, if they can hang on to the underclassmen they have right now, that's a, that's a good team. I mean, you, oh yeah, you bring back Dylan to zoo, Brock Cunningham, Dylan Mitchell, Tyrese Hunter, Arterio Morris, Ron Holland, and 
AJ Johnson plus some guys out of the portal. That's why Rodney Terry's saying stuff like, we'll be a Monday night program and we'll we'll be there sooner than you think. Yeah. Yeah. The uh all of the ingredients are in the basket now. They just have to extend the that there. And and I, I think it'll do it. I mean, this can be fun to watch, as you said, you know. Um Rodney Terry talked about the Moody Center helping, you know, one of the best home court advantages in college basketball that helps with recruiting the brand of Texas helps with recruiting, but the players do too. And if, if they can hold on to some of these players, that's only going to show recruits and people in the portal, like, man, these guys could try to, you know, pursue other things and they're coming back for a reason. What's that reason? And they want to find that out. So I think this could be a really good um, time for Texas basketball in a time that we probably thought was going to be in shambles right now, you know, coming off of that uh, really just, unexpected type of season um but yeah great great run by them and uh we haven't even talked we're 36 minutes and we haven't even talked about football i don't think that's I ever happened ever ever on the flagship probably podcast. will never probably will never happen <laughs> never again will. i know normally like we're like okay football football is king let's keep it on football keep it on football short other stuff but yeah no this this was worth talking about though chip yeah well, and <laughs> let's get our football fix in before we get to love it or leave it. Obviously, it was uh, a big weekend for Texas football. You had the um, coaches clinic with Kyle Shanahan, uh, the guru, mm -hmm. uh, offensive guru, who, of course, played football at Texas, finished his football career at Texas after starting at Duke and um, cool for Kyle to come back. He was part of the Chris Sims era. Chris Sims is one of his best friends. They have a, a tattoo. Uh, Rod Babers, who you hear on the on the Blitz, the wood. There was a group of, of friends um, who, you know, had, they, they called themselves the wood and they had the tattoo um, to go with it. So uh, Kyle Shanahan comes back for all the high school coaches. Then there's the, the scrimmage where the high school coaches are allowed to watch. I heard it was, um, you know, practice scrimmage. Sark's been kind of downplaying scrimmage, but it was a lot of scrimmage situations. Mm -hmm. And um, I think both sides of the ball made uh, some plays. I, I think, you know, um, one of the names I heard as kind of a, Ooh, was Cedric Baxter, CJ Baxter, the freshman running back, just catching the football, uh, making a big play after catching the football and making it look easy. And uh, he's, you know, popped an explosive run. So, you know, it's early, it's, it's whatever, but you're just looking for little nuggets of who can make a play each day in practice that causes someone to say, Hmm, okay. All right. You're showing me something here. So uh, a little nugget there. And of course, the junior day, the big, whatever, barbecue junior day where they had some of the elites in Taylor, um, in, including Colin Simmons, the number three player in the nation in the 2024 recruiting class, uh, edge rusher out of Duncanville. This is a guy, you know, Texas has done really well in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. This is a guy that the Longhorns really need to get. So to have him on campus um, was a big deal and we'll see how they see how they close on that. Yeah. As a uh, number one edge in the state of tech or never one edge, excuse me, in the 2024 signing class, according to the 24 seven sports composite, as you said, number three national player. I mean, yeah, this is a big guy. And as you mentioned, I mean, Duncanville has been, Texas has been good to Duncanville and Duncanville has been good to Texas too in recent years. Um, but yeah, the more they can get those type of guys on campus, the the better it is, honestly. I mean, especially it, around practice situations now that Texas and spring ball has a full uh, – I don't know if the, the recruits can go to practice themselves. I'm not 100% sure how that works with this. But now that they have a team that they can actually do a scrimmage type of situation and then seeing like what it's going to look like because there's actually offensive line out there, um, that helps too. But yeah, getting him – getting those type of guys on campus as much as possible is huge. And um, if you did not read the stampede on Monday, 
Mike and Hudson are still trying to gather a little bit more information on Colin Simmons' vis visit, but the initial um, feedback was seems to suggest that Texas made a good impression. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, the momentum, we talk about it all the time. Texas has had great momentum in recruiting. They were able to sustain it with the eight wins uh, this past season, but now it's time to to take it up a notch. I think Steve Sarkeesian understands that. Uh, he's certainly been recruiting in that direction. So um, also on the other side of the ball, um, some kudos for Byron Murphy on the defensive line, just hearing that he's becoming more and more of a problem um, for the offensive line to handle and might, might be getting ready to take the same kind of step that Moro Ojimo and Keandre Coburn took last year. So uh, some, some praise and also for Tavondre sweat. Uh, they, they feel really good about this defensive line with those two in the lineup. So um, we'll have more of course on spring football as uh, I, I have a question for you real quick. Sorry, not to cut yeah. you off, but does Byron Murphy, like, I, I feel like I'm waiting for him to take that step that Puna Ford took. There's something about it. And maybe it's just because they kind of are, I mean, I think, I think Byron Murphy might be a little bit taller than Puna Ford was a little bit thinner, not much. And I just, I feel like he is about to make that, that jump that Puna Ford made and um, just be kind of that silent assassin um, on the defensive line that helps the whole defense get better. I mean, I remember when Malik Jefferson was named the Big 12 Defensive Player of the Year in 2017, I had asked him, I was like, you know, obviously you guys are getting a ton of credit, but how critical was it was Puna Ford in this? And he was like, he was like, uh, I would not have been the Big 12 Defensive Player of the Year. And he's like, and Deshaun Elliott would not have been a Thorpe Award runner-up either or semifinalist without Puna Ford because he made their job so much easier. And I just, I don't know, it may just be kind of like build recognition that I keep thinking in my head like, oh, Byron Murphy's ready for that Puna Ford jump. Is that weird? Have yeah. you thought that? Am I just a weirdo for thinking no, that? <laughs> because playmaking defensive tackles are called job security for coaches. Yes. I mean, they're yeah. so hard to find. And when you find them, they're like, you know, finding a snow fox or a, you know, the white uh, tiger or something, you know, I mean, it's just, uh, Nemo, <laughs> just <kidding>. Nemo. I <laughs> mean, you gotta, you gotta have them, the, the elite programs have them. And, and so I don't, I don't think you're, I think you're right on the money. I mean, I think this defensive line there, I keep hearing that it's the strength of the team. You'll take that all the, t all the time. I mean, that's uh, when you can call one of your line of scrimmage or your lines of scrimmage, a strength in Texas from what we're hearing from Steve Sarkeesian and others, they feel like both lines are a strength. Then that's, that's when you're, you're poised for takeoff. Yeah, that's how you compete with the the big boys in SEC football and um, actually, you know, sustain making runs like kind of. I mean, I don't think OU necessarily is a good example, but being in the position to continue to, you know, be successful in a way that OU kind of was. But like how Alabama has been, Georgia has been the last few years, they they start with those big humans They they because they help bring in the skill talent and big guys want to play with some of the best players too. So, you know, Arch Manning coming in offensive linemen are going to want to block for him, just like they want to block for Quinn Ewers. I mean, there's so many ripple effects when it comes to recruiting the right type of talent at certain positions. I think um, the defense and offensive line is, are those type of positions too. Yeah. Remember when I uh, said right after Sarkeesian got hired that he was hired to compete and match wits with Lincoln Riley at Oklahoma right. as an offensive mind. But Sarkeesian was also telling people, we're going to build this program to compete in the SEC. Well, now you're seeing it mm -hmm. with, with the, the giant humans on the offensive line. Um, you know, the, the high quality defensive line play and improving defense. Um, and it all needs to keep progressing. I mean, it, it, they didn't arrive last year. They lost games. They should have won. They played completely 
you know, I, I don't, I mean, they tried hard against TCU, but they couldn't, they couldn't adjust. They couldn't come up with an answer at home mm-hmm. against TCU. And so, you know, there's a, there's still a big step to take as a program, but uh, he's got, he's got talented players. He's got talented players in leadership positions at really every position on defense. And let's see how the quarterback position develops this year with Quinn Ewers and, and that offensive line, Kelvin Banks running backs going to be huge. And, uh, and Steve Sarkeesian, his side of the ball, the offense is the side of the ball that probably held this team back um, Mm -hmm. the most last year of those in those losses. So that, that needs to change. And, And so we're all, we're watching all of that and keeping you, up to date over at horns 24 7.com the insiders coming out thursday morning so if you're not a member at horns 24 7 what's going on let's go all right taylor you ready for some love it or leave it i am before we get to love it or leave it we're going to keep or take excuse me a really quick break but stay tuned we have more football talk and a little bit more basketball talk coming up we'll be right back and if you're watching us on the horns 24 7 youtube channel we will roll on here. All right, Chip, you uh, you want a football or a basketball? Love it or leave it first. All right, we were talking football, so let's uh, let's stay on football. All right, first one for you is love it or leave it. Right now, the freshman you think will have the biggest impact this season is wide receiver Jonte Cook. I don't know. After hearing about uh, C.J. Baxter. And how comfortable he looks, I might have to leave this. And as of right now, say CJ Baxter. Okay. Now I'm I'm a huge proponent of Jonathan Brooks, but we're talking about freshmen. And something tells me CJ Baxter is gonna be in the running back rotation. What if he's not number one, he's probably gonna be number two. So we know how much um Roshan Johnson how many carries he got. And, and so I'm going to, I'm going to leave this Taylor because I'm kind of leaning towards CJ Baxter right now, but how about you? I'm kind of torn here. Okay. Let me ask you this. Are you, would you say you're leaving it because you think there's other, like more like proven talent at receiver that will maybe keep John Tay cook, not from contributing as much, or you think probably, yeah, probably you got, you got, you know, Xavier Worthy, who who Jonte Cook is very similar to. Um, and then, you know, now you have A.D. Mitchell and Isaiah Nayer back. So it might be might be a little more difficult or at least be part of a rotation. But I mean, Jonte Cook's pretty talented. So, yeah, I think I'm going to that's that's what I was curious. So that's where I've been kind of like, will Jonte Cook have much opportunity to show, you know, be it, make a huge impact as a freshman this season with the way that the receiver room is right now and comparing it with the running back room, I feel like I have to leave it too and would say CJ Baxter probably has more of the opportunity to do so. Now I would, I want to see, you know, Jonathan Brooks take that next step. I want to see what Jaden Blue can be too. Cause I mean, that was no scrub of a recruit. I mean, remember before he decided to sit out his senior season of high school football, he was a top 100 prospect. I think he was like, I mean, I think he may have been like top 50 or maybe like top 40 type of um, prospect in the 24 seven sports composite. I don't have it right in front of me, but he was a very, very highly touted prospect. Um, but I think just with losing Bijan Robinson, losing uh, Roshan Johnson, Keelan Robinson, going through rehab, not participating, this gives CJ Baxter an opportunity to earn some playing time a little bit right now. So I think that's probably the safe bet. It's not a knock on Jonte Cooks. I think Jonte Cook is going to be a very special player. I mean, he was one that Mike Roach has pointed to as the guy that he was most excited for. I remember a few years ago, one of the recruits Mike Roach covered that was a guy that he pointed to as someone he's been would look forward to was 
Byron Murphy. So <laughs> we were just talking about him. So I think I think John Tay Cook will be special. I just don't know if he'll need to be special this year where CJ Baxter may have more of an opportunity. Uh, Jaden Blue, by the way, uh, nationally 195 and 15th best running back in the country in the 2022 recruiting was class. That bef- was that um, where he finished? Um. I was just looking in that because uh... I think before I think he dropped substantially when he opted out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably where had... it's definitely where he finished. Yeah. So where he was prior to that, I believe, was like a top fifty prospect, and then um, a lot of ranking services dropped him just because they didn't know what was going on. I think a lot of it. Um, but yeah, I think I don't think we can need to forget about him. I'm, I'm yeah. curious to see how he's going to do. Yeah, and he's. He's lightning fast. And so mm-hmm. let's see, let's see who performs uh, when it's the brightest. And that's going to be a lot of fun to watch. There's, we've been talking about all these position battles that are so uh, interesting. I mean, and there's a chance you're going to have a rotation at, at positions like running back and receiver and uh, corner, um, it, 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 weak side linebacker and, and so it's going to be fun. I mean, I'm actually, I'm actually kind of interested to see, you know, the spring game. I know it'll be vanilla, but you still want to see guys making some plays and you want to see how they look up close. And, and so there's some intrigue in this, uh, in this spring football that we have going on. April 15th yeah. is the spring game. April 15th. Yeah. And uh, real quick, uh, Jaden blue, in uh, sorry the highest rated he was was april um 2021 he was number 48 in the country according to 24 7 sports composite hey i'm like a sponge that's so funny like i always would tell my husband like if uh you can't tell me that i'm not going to remember something because i always remember everything it's the (laughs) dumbest things i remember i wish i remembered like cool things but those are type of things that i do remember so (laughs) nice (laughs) <laughs> nice work. Yeah. Well, right. uh, love it or one. leave it. Number two. Love it or leave it. A five-year deal at roughly $3 million annually for Rodney Terry means Texas was able to replace Chris Beard on the cheap. I mean, you know, that, that makes it sound like uh, they're getting a used car or something. So yeah. <laughs> I'm going to leave this because, um, look, Rodney Terry – who's never made more than, you know, 750,000 at Utah, 850,000 this season at Texas going to 3 million. That's, that's game changing yeah. money for Rodney Terry. Not bad for a, a kid from Angleton, Texas, who played his college basketball right here in Austin at St. Ed's. Uh, but, you know, 3 million puts him also in that category with, you know, with guys who've, you know, had a, more illustrious uh, power five coaching career uh, mentioned Scott Drew's at 3.7 million, Ronnie Terry at 3 million. Oh, you know, that sounds about right. So I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to leave this cause you know, getting him on the cheap. Yeah. He's, he's $2 million less per year than Chris Beard and Chris Beard took Texas tech uh, to the national championship game. And then to an elite eight, well, Ronnie Terry's, been to an elite eight. Now he thanks Chris Beard for helping build the culture and bringing in, you know, the players who, uh, who helped lead this team to an elite eight this year. Uh, and kudos to Rodney. He has thanked Chris Beard at every turn said, I love him like a brother, even through all of the foibles. So, uh, but still I'm going to leave this Taylor. How about you? Yeah. I, I don't like the word cheap. I would say, did they get a deal? Probably. Yeah. Because I mean, Chris Beard was, I looked it up. I think he was the number six highest paid coach in college basketball prior to him getting fired. Um, And so, you know, it's not like college football where you're getting $13 million a year contracts or things like that. It's a little bit different ball game, but um, for Texas to get a guy that's proven it, you know, at Texas as an assistant coach, um, say what you will about his record as a head coach other places, as you'd mentioned, he had to build cultures, you know, and, and build those programs from 
losing programs to being competitive. Um, you know, I think I think this is a fair amount. Austin's a lot more expensive too to live in than Waco. So I think that <laughs> probably plays a little bit of a role. Um, anybody that lives in Austin here, you know what we're talking about. But <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I'm going to leave it. I don't like the word cheap. I'll say they got a very uh, cost effective replacement for Chris Beard that I think is a very valuable one, though. Yeah. And everybody looks at Chris Beard and, and expects a Chris Beard team to be in the mix, right? It, to be a top 10 team, to be a team that is is either contending or on the verge of contending for the final four. And he he built a team that was 12 minutes away from the final four. So now Rodney Terry gets to, you know, build that and and do it from a position of uh, a winning program of one of the biggest brands in recruiting. And, uh, and so it's gonna be fun to watch because they could not be more opposite. You know, Chris yeah. Beard is so intense and just so focused and driven on, you know, being in that national championship game again, a, a game that haunts him still because, um, you know, Virginia hits a last second three to force overtime and then beats his Texas tech team in, uh, in overtime, but, um, you know, Rodney Terry's a guy who's sitting here telling you, Hey, we're going to coach him hard, but we're also going to enjoy and soak up the process. Life's too short. And I can't wait to see how that, uh, translates. Yeah. He's definitely a likable guy too. And, um, I mean, you know, what, just seeing him in the press conference, feeling like you were in the locker room, watching a team meeting, I mean, for him to, that's, that's a, you can't fake that. You can't like, you, you cannot fake it. So what you saw, what we saw today in his introductory press conference is what you're going to see in the locker room. If you're a recruit, if you're going to see in the locker room, if you're a play, player at Texas and you're going to hear those type of stories. Cause I, I mean, I, I don't think you can fake that. Right. Like I've never, I've never seen a press conference intro press conference like that. No, now it's a different situation, but still like, it was like, this is amazing. This is fascinating, like fascinating to just witness this exchange when he's being, you know, named the head coach like that. And it's like we were just flies on the wall while he was talking to his team. It was really cool. Yeah. Real quick, Brock Cunningham, who's one of the funniest deadpan funny guys on that team. As as they started winning, he said, OK, guys, let's make this a 30 for 30. Let's mm -hmm. make this a 30 for 30. And then he would just keep saying, okay, guys, let's keep making this a 30 for 30. And, and by the end of the year, they were all joking about it. It probably would be a hell of yeah. a 30 for 30 an instant classic 30 for 30. Um, yeah. But they just wait 10 years. Chip will be commentating on the 30 yeah. for 30 for the Texas basketball, 2022, 2023 team. <laughs> right. But um, you know, when Ronnie brought up that, grasshopper or eagle thing this is the kind of goofball rodneyism that these guys came to laugh at and okay. all of them and when i said what stands out most about rodney terry when i was talking to the players before you know they went off to the sweet 16 they're like how funny he is how mm -hmm. how much comic relief He'll, he'll just say something in the middle of practice. Like when you think he's about to explode and he'll say something like, really, you know, this is what <laughs> I'm getting. This is the kind of effort I'm getting. And, and they'll all be like, man, you just, it's hard not to like the guy. So yeah, it, it, um, it's an interesting mix and I'm just excited to see how it, uh, how it grows and, and translates uh, into a Rodney, terry stamped program yeah i mean texas had some pretty solid people from angleton texas if you uh hey okay. back to quandre diggs and andre diggs quentin jammer quentin jammer yep good call good call right Great there here. <laughs> all right one more for you chip love it or leave it texas fans should be concerned about rodney terry's overall head coaching record with which is just above 500 you know it's interesting um, because I was able to talk to Steve Fisher, who was the interim head coach at Michigan, who won a national title in 1989. And then um, 
went to San Diego State and retired in 2017 as the all-time winningest coach in Mountain West and San Diego State history. But he went up against Rodney Terry when Terry was at Fresno. And so I called Steve Fisher and, you know, he's like, you know, Texas has a history of going for the big name. And he said, some people are going to, you know, talk about Rodney Terry's coaching record. He said, if you're concerned about that, you have not done your homework about what he inherited and the difficulties he had just to make those programs competitive. And he was right. I went back, I looked at it. Fresno State forced four straight losing seasons before Rodney got there. UTEP, two straight losing seasons before Rodney got there. Rodney always had players. I mean, he had Bryson Williams at Fresno State who ended up transferring to Texas Tech. Uh, well, he went to UTEP with Rodney, then to Texas Tech when Rodney left uh, to come to Texas. Um, Bryson Williams was an All-Big 12 player, first team at Texas Tech. Uh, Sule Boom, who, you know, he got to come to UTEP from – San Francisco, Sule Boom, leading scorer for Xavier. Uh, they were reunited in the Sweet 16 with Rodney uh, prevailing. You know, Rodney had good players. And, um, you know, he put a couple of guys in the NBA from, from Fresno. And he, he was pushing a rock up a hill uh, at those programs. And like he said, I didn't enjoy it as much as I should have. Part of the reason he left UTEP to go to, uh, to Texas. So I'm going to leave this. Uh, Taylor, um, how about you? Yeah, I, I'm going to leave it to I, as much as I don't like agreeing with you every time. But um, I, I think think about um, Steve Sarkeesian. People pointed to his his overall head coaching record. And a lot of it was at Washington. And it's like, do you know what he and he inherited a team that went 0 and 12 the year before? Oh, and like, I think the three years prior, it won four games over three seasons before going 0 and 12. And it's like he made that a consistent bowl eligible team. And now look where Washington football is. I think looking at the records of coaches, especially when they're fresh in their career and not looking at the programs that they inherit, it's kind of silly. You know, um, I remember one time we had that, that one meeting the first time with Tom Herman. And one of the smartest things I think Tom Herman said was like, coaching is all about following the right coach. You never want to follow the legend as in talking about Mac Brown. You don't want to be the coach that follows Mac Brown. You want to be the coach that follows the coach that followed Mac Brown. <laughs> and, um, you know, and that was what he had at Houston too. I mean, it, it's about kind of like the moves that you make. And if you can be successful and turn a program around and people aren't going to look at that, that's, that's kind of stupid, honestly, like you have to look at the whole picture. And um, I'm not I'm not worried about his overall head coaching record, just like I was not worried about Steve Sarkeesian's because context is key. And there's a lot of context that will kind of fill in the gaps. So you have the facts and uh, of what everything is. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave this. Um, I'm gonna look at what Rodney Terry did. And this staff did with this team this season in the situation that they were in, because regardless of how good the players are, and how good the coaches are, what Texas basketball went through could have easily just led to a terrible season. And nobody probably would have been saying a word about it. They, If Texas would have not made the tournament, they'd probably been like, well, of course not. Look what happened to them. And it's the opposite. They made it the furthest in the tournament since 2008. So I'm basing my judgment off that Rodney Terry. I'm not looking at the, you know, the overall record. Stats are for losers, like Will Muschamp said that time. So yeah, meh. Staying away from the stats and looking at the actual product we've seen. Yeah. Yeah. No, good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, how's your bracket looking? Oh, it was busted. Uh, I think the first weekend. So yeah. <laughs> I never, I've like, I mean, I've admitted on the flagship podcast, I'm not a huge basketball person. I'll step in if Chip and Jeff are both busy, but um, football, baseball are more my cup of tea. So I pretty much, I put my bracket together, I think like 10 minutes before it was like a family bracket tournament that we do. And like, I was like the last one to put it in. I was like, Oh, I don't care. <laughs> I did yeah. have Texas going to the elite eight and losing to um, my, I think it was Miami. So wow. I got the, mid, the Midwest side of the bracket. I did pretty well. The rest of nice. it, it was like, no, um, I forget who I picked my winner. It was a team that lost 
Pur Purdue. I picked Purdue before <laughs> to win it all. So <laughs> I am not a bracketologist. Don't ever ask me for my opinion on that. I love it. I am not a bracketologist. <laughs> That's fantastic. How's um, your bracket looking? Oh, it's terrible. It's destroyed. Yeah. <laughs> but um, speaking of baseball, Taylor, how about uh, the Longhorns sweeping Texas Tech? and re-entering the rankings. So David Pierce uh, gets it done against number 14, Texas Tech in Austin at the dish, six to two, six to five, nine to eight. Oh, there were some harrowing moments in those games, but um, well done by uh, Texas baseball, which certainly got off to a, a rough start. Uh, but man, three and zero in big 12 play at this point. So all right, everybody, thanks so much for tuning in to this edition of the Flagship Podcast. For Taylor Estes, I am Chip Brown. Thanks for listening. Until next time, we'll see you over at horns247.com. Stay safe and keep the faith.